Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Austin Borche. I'm an independent contractor from Argentina. And this is my colleague, Thomas Heller. He is a researcher at the Friedrich Alexander University from Germany. <coughs> we are both members of the Stellar Group. And at the Stellar Group, we develop and design and implement the HPX framework. Uh, HPX is a general C++ uh, runtime system um, that builds on top of the threading uh, clause of the standard library, as well as the, as, the, um, as the extensions proposed, the concurrency TS, the parallelism TS, and some extensions of our own. And it keeps the, the developer uh, the tools to build to create applications that scale um, and to take advantage of the hardware uh, be it uh, a workstation, a supercomputer, or even a phone, a phone with multiple cores. Um, so HPX is heavily based on the C++11 uh, facilities uh, for threading. We implement the threading clause, we implement thread, future, async, mute six, condition variables. Um, and I'm gonna talk, the first part of the talk, I'm going to describe that functionality, the functionality that is currently in the standard today, and that is heading towards standardization, as well as some extensions of our own. And on the second part of the talk, uh, Thomas is going to talk about our specific implementation and how we perform uh, local tasks and remote tasks and even GPU tasks. All right, so. Let's start with the future. The HPX framework is mainly uh, built around the concept of a future. <clears throat> the future concept was introduced into C++ uh, with C++11 as a mechanism for a thread to return a value, to transfer a value back to a caller. Um, here's uh, how we use futures. First, we have a sequential function that calls two other functions, compute x, compute y. In the sequential execution, uh, first we call compute x, and the body of compute x uh, executes. And at some point, after executing a few steps, it will return a value. The value will be used to initialize uh, x there. And then we'll go to compute y. And then again, we're going to get a result back, and we're going to add those two. That's typical sequential execution. Now, we want to execute those two functions concurrently. Let's say that they take a fair amount of time to execute, and most machines today have at least two cores. So it makes sense to, to run these two at the same time. So what we're going to do is we're going to use async. And async is a facility that takes a, a callable or a function object, as well as a number of arguments, and it invokes that, that function as if uh, in a new thread. So async is going to return uh, immediately. All that async is going to do is it's going to schedule a thread to run this function. And it's not even going to wait for the thread to, to, to uh, start executing. It will return immediately. So it obviously cannot return an int because the operation has not been executed yet, potentially. So what it returns instead is a future int. As in, sometime in the future, this operation will complete and will return an int. And when it does, you can get it here. So we start to execute compute x as if on a new thread. And we run compute y in the current thread. So at this point, both compute x and compute y are running. And once we are done with compute y, we need to get the result of the other operation in order to go on. So we call future.get. And when we call .get, then either the asynchronous operation already finished and return a value, in which case .get returns immediately, returning whatever value compute x returned. Or if compute x hasn't finished executing yet, then it will sus suspend execution and wait until it does. And once it does, it will return that value. Now, another possibility 
is for compute x to throw an exception instead. So in the sequential case, if it throws an exception, we simply go out of the block and the exception is propagated. In the async case, th that exception will be returned at the point that we call .get. So either if the function returns a value or throws an exception, whenever we are ready to consume that value or exception, we call .get and we get that value. Now, on the other end of a future, it's an asynchronous provider, it's someone that, that puts the value or the exception <coughs> that the future is going to read. And the way a provider promise is the, the, the fundamental provider. Uh, the way that this works is we construct a promise and we get a future that is somehow connected to that promise. Uh, the two of those share some details. And one goes in one way, the other stays here where it is. And at some point, we set a value on the promise, and that reflects on the future that is connected to that promise. So there is some state between the future and the promise uh, that is shared, and it's called the share state. And the share state is what, what does all the magic behind uh, transferring the future from a thread back to a caller. And for a share state, what we need to know, remember the share state can hold either value or an exception, whatever the, the result of the function was. So the share state needs to know if it's empty because the operation hasn't finished yet, or if it did finish, whether it has a value or an exception, and in that case, the corresponding value or exception. And it needs a, a mutex and a condition variable to synchronize access to the share state because both the promise and the future will be potentially uh, touching the same values at the same time. And the future may need to wait for a condition to be satisfied for the share state to have a value in it. And that's what we use the condition variable for. So from the promise side, the provider side, whenever the, the share state has to be made ready, has to be set with a value or an exception. All we need to do is we need to lock that mutex and we construct a new value or a new exception in place, uh, depending if it was a value or an exception. We set the status correspondingly and after that we call notify all on the condition variable so that if any future is waiting on it, uh, the future wakes up. Now you may notice that I have these extra braces in here, this extra scoping. That's not accidental. When the future wakes, if a future is waiting, when the future wakes up, it will try to grab a lock on this same mutex. So when we call notify all, first we want the, this mutex that we lock here to be unlocked so that the thread, when the thread wakes up, can grab a lock on the mutex. Otherwise it would go back to sleep again. All right, so here's how a promise looks, more or less. It creates a new share state when it's constructed questionnaire. Um, yeah, in the previous slide, is it necessary that everyone sees every update, or is only the latest update needed? There is only one update. Okay. The, the, repeat the question. It's, it's necessary that everyone sees uh, every update, yeah, or just the... Yeah. Okay, no. That's, that's a good question. Uh, there is only one value ever set to a promise. Remember that a future and a promise, they represent a remote, uh, a, a result that was produced by an asynchronous operation. And operations only return a result once. So we can only set a value or an exception once. After the promise, call these methods in the share state. It won't touch the share state anymore. So let's go back to the promise. I said that we construct a share state when we construct a promise. And then whenever the user wants to set a value or an, or an exception, we have to call the corresponding function in the share state. Now, it's not that trivial, because as I, as I said right now, 
uh, it can only be set once. So there is some bookkeeping in here in case that set value or set exception has been called already, in which case it throws an exception, promise already satisfied. So there is some bookkeeping involved too. Now for the future part, the return object. How do we get the value out of the share state, the, the result out of the share state? Well, we start again by grabbing a lock on the mutex, and then we simply ask to wait until this, con this condition is satisfied, the condition that, that the share state is ready. It either has a value or an exception. Now, I'm using the predicate form of condition variable dot wait. So if the, if the condition is already satisfied when we call it, there will be no waiting at all. It will return immediately. And more importantly, if the condition variable wakes up spuriously, it will go back to sleep if the condition hasn't been satisfied. The predicate condition basically runs a loop on the condition uh, waiting on the condition variable. So once the, we return from the call to condition variable dot wait, we know that we either have a value or an exception. If we have an, ex an exception, we simply retrow it here. Otherwise, we return a reference to that value. And with that, let's see how the future is implemented. So the future holds a shared um, reference to the shared state, uh, which by default is a null pointer. But when you call get future on a promise, the promise knows how to construct this future uh, with a reference to the shared state the promise has, so that the two are connected. And when we call dot get on a future, we first move this shared pointer out of the future, and then we call dot get uh, well arrow get on the shared state. And at this point, this will suspend if it has to because the result is not ready and it will either throw if there was an exception or it will return a reference to the value if there was one. And we're going to move it, we're going to move the value in the case that there's a value, we're going to move it out of the share state and we're going to return a new one, um, move constructed from whatever was in the share state. Now why am I moving this share pointer? out of the member and into a local? Well, uh, a result cannot be read twice either. Once you read the result, the future becomes invalid. The shared, the shared pointer uh, to the shared state goes to null pointer again. So what I do here is we move the pointer to the shared state into a local, and at this point the member is null pointer again. So the future has become invalid. And when this goes out of scope, the reference for the share state decrements, in which case it could potentially uh, destroy the share, the share state. That's why we need to move the value out and return it as a value instead of a, an R value reference. All right, that's the future uh, that C11 offers us. Uh, it's all the functionality that it provides us. And it's good, and it's a great abstraction, but it's not enough. And there's a lot of work uh, going into improving the future and the way we, we work with it. Uh, the main issue with the future in C11 is composition. We have this nice abstraction, that's the future, but we cannot compose futures. Let's say this is the function that we had before. Uh, let's say that instead of suspending here and then adding whatever uh, y is, we want to return a new future that whenever x is made ready, it will be made ready itself with whatever value x hold plus y. So what C11 offers us is this. We can, we can start a new thread in which we will only wait for the future until the future is ready, and once it does, we will add y to it. This does have the effect that we want of getting a future that is composed. We compose the future x with the value y, but it's not really, it's not really an, an advantage. Uh, it's not really a good solution. 
because we're creating a new thread. We didn't want it to, to call that get here because we didn't want to suspend that thread. And here what we're doing is we're just having a new thread uh, do the suspension. And uh, the reason this is problematic is because threads are, um, are resources and they, they have an associated cost. In your typical standard library implementation, uh, threads and async is associated with, with uh, system, operative system <coughs> threads, which are scarce resource. Try to spin more than a couple hundred threads and see what happens. Uh, in HPX, threads are lightweight, and you can create as many as your memory will let you have. Uh, and why I say memory? Because threads have a stack. That's the whole point why we use threads. We want to run code on a separate stack. And that stack is usually implemented as a large chunk of memory somewhere. So every time we create a thread, there is some memory out there representing the stack of that thread. So what we want to do instead, and this is part of the concurrent CTS that is uh, going out to Valet, is uh, to compose, as we said, this future, <coughs> what the concurrency TS offers is mainly uh, for the future part of it is dot uh, then. And dot then, what it does is whenever the future x is ready, it will invoke this other function, this lambda or callable that we pass into it with the future x itself. And at that point, we are guaranteed that if we call dot get, there will be no suspension because the condition is that the future is ready. So this will return immediately. And this will compute the value and return the composed value that we wanted. Now, as I said, the, the important thing about the then compared to, compared to this approach, the async approach, you will note that they are pretty similar. Uh, the big advantage that this has is that we don't need to start a thread and put it to sleep immediately. We don't need to start a thread at all until we know that the dependency has been satisfied. And at that point, we create the thread, and the thread does very little work, so we'll return immediately. And we will only be allocating memory for a stack for a brief period of time. And this allows us to have millions of threads continuations created in this way. Now let's look at how we implement that in HPX. First, the share state. For the share state, we're going to have some uh, container of callbacks. Um, I'm showing here a vector of function void to simplify. Uh, but it's a, it's a collection of callbacks to call once the share state is made ready. And we have a function to attach a callback to a share state. And when we, when we attach a callback, we, of course, will grab the lock, and we see if the future, if the share state is still empty. If it is, we are going to put the callback into that collection. If it's not, then we're going to unlock the lock, and we're going to end up here, where we call the callback immediately, because the future, the share state, sorry, is ready. And then whenever we made the share state ready, for instance, at value, all we have to do is we have to call every single one of those callbacks. That's simple. Sorry? The question is if I should block on the callback. <coughs> now you shouldn't work on the callback, but the callbacks are not user defined. I will show it in a minute. The callback is an implementation detail. Here's how we implement dot then. We have a new share state uh, that takes a, a continuation and the future. The continuation is the function that we're going to call with the future itself once the future is ready. And this share state will have a value of whatever calling that continuation with the future gives. And when we construct this new share state, we're going to attach a callback that will run uh, that continuation. Now, dot then uh, we'll call that continuation 
as if on a new thread just assessing this. I'm simplifying here and I'm showing, I'm running it in place. Um, initially, I had, initially I had a call to async here, but that's not true. What we actually do here is we use the same internal mechanisms that async uses to start a new thread and put work in a new thread. So when we run that continuation, so back to your question about whether you can block or not here. <coughs> You cannot block, but you are not the one giving those callbacks. Uh, we are, and the callback is run this thing somewhere else in a new thread. Um, so you said that you have that async of one area of the async, but it's still using the uh, Yes, internally, the implementation uses, the question is if, uh, if, I had, if this is using async or not. Um, it does two parts to async. One is scheduling uh, a piece of work to be executed as if in a new thread, and the other part is setting the mechanism for returning a future that is connected to the result of that task. Now, the mechanism for returning the, the result of that task is a shared state itself, so we don't need that part here. I, I originally used async run here, but async run returns a future that we are not really using, we are not really interested in. So this is simplified code. They share the same implementation on how to start new, new task of work. And when we run that continuation, remember this happens as if in a new thread, uh, we simply call the continuation uh, with the future. And if it returns a value, we use that to set the value of the shared state. And if it throws an exception, we set the exception of the share state with whatever exception we got. And here is how we implement it then. So what do we need? We need a new share state, uh, a share state that is the continuation, a dot then share state. So we need that dot then share state for our continuation, the continuation that was given to us, and the future ourselves. And we need to know what the result of calling that continuation with a future will be, because the future that we return is a future of that type. So say I have a future of type int, and I call dot then to string uh, x dot get, and what I get back is not is a future of type string, because it's the type that the continuation returns. So we simply return a future of whatever the continuation will return with the share state of that share state, special share state that I just described, with the continuation, and we move, up, we move ourselves into the share state. So similarly to dot get, once we return for dot then, the future is invalid, the, the share pointer to the share state is null, otherwise you would be able to call dot then multiple times, and you would be eventually reading the result multiple times. Now, this is the key, dot then is the key functionality that allows us to scale because it allows us to define uh, small pieces of work, small tasks, and we implicitly define the dependencies between those tasks by x dot then. We know that this task implicitly depends on x. So the framework knows that, and it can schedule this task as soon as the dependencies are ready we, we schedule the next one, and in the meantime, whenever the, the, the continuation, the task is not running, is not using a thread, is not grabbing memory for a stack, it costs us pretty much nothing. It costs us the, the memory space to put the continuation itself, and you know the primitives, the share state that I just showed. That's the cost of a continuation while it's not being run. Now, this looks ugly. It does, it allows us to, to scale, and we use it today, but we know it looks ugly. This, keep in mind, this is just adding two integers. Look how adding two integers looks. So there's work being done uh, to have resumable functions. Uh, resumable functions are not just restricted to, to futures, uh, but they do help uh, for the future case. 
uh, they let us write things like use the await operator. So we simply say await x, then add y. And these two codes are functionally identical. Underneath await is pretty much doing the same that we are doing here with the ugly syntax. Uh, now, Gore is the one that's running the, the resumable function proposal. If you want to hear more about it, he has a talk here later on the week that you can attend. Now, that was sequential composition. Dot then lets us uh, schedule a task after another task. But what if we want to have a parallel composition? What if we want to have dependencies more than one task as a dependency? Well, the concurrency TS offers us, uh, among other things, one all. One all returns takes as input, in this case, a pair of iterators to futures. And it returns a new future with a vector of those futures that will be made ready once all the futures in this vector has been made ready. And the reason that it returns a vector of future here is that you can think of when all as the parallel version, the, the, the um, n-dimensional version of the then. Remember that the then invalidates the future that you call it on. And when all uh, similarly will invalidate each of the futures in this, in this vector. So we need to get them back somehow to get to the results. So when all has to return uh, all those futures that it consumed back to us. Now here is how we implement 1.0 in HPX. We have a separate share state 2. Uh, this share state will return, will hold the vector of futures. And we have all the, the result will hold all the, the futures that were passed on to us, the range of futures that was passed to 1.0. And we have an index 2. And what we do is we will attach a callback to the first one of the guys that the futures that were passed to us. And once the first guy is ready, it's gonna call this one, this function here. The function will increment the index, and if there are still futures to wait on, it will attach a continuation, a callback to the next future. And eventually they will all be ready. And at that point, we're gonna set ourselves as ready with that vector uh, of futures. Now with that, uh, implementing when all is again simply returning a future of the right return type with share state that, that I just show. There's also, in the concurrent CTS, there's also an, an overload of when all that takes a variadic number of futures, uh, either future or share future, to whatever results it could be one future int, one future void, one shared future string, whatever. And it will return a future with a tuple of all the inputs that we have. Because again, those futures will be invalidated when we call one all. So they have to be returned back to us somehow. Now, before I go on, you will notice that you may be wondering why we do this uh, one step at a time. Why not setting a callback on all the futures that we have and have them increment an atomic counter somehow until they are ready. Well, our first implementation actually did that. We had an atomic counter and on construction we set a, a callback on every single one of the futures. To update that, that, that uh, atomic counter until it was ready. Now, the use cases that we have, for instance, include having a vector of futures that represent the result of some task, and we want to wait on, uh, we want to call one all on a hundred or a thousand or however many futures. And what we found out was that the atomic counter in here uh, was a point of contention. Uh, these tasks uh, were pretty similar. They took more or less the same amount of time to execute. So they will finish more or less at the same time. And then the hundred of futures will try to hit on the atomic counter at the same time. Uh, and it was even worse because we had to maintain the share state alive somehow. I'm not showing that here, 
but we need to be sure that as long as there's a callback out there, the shared state remains alive. Otherwise, when the callback fires, it's going to attach memory that, that is no longer there. So in our first iteration, we were using uh, uh, an equivalent to enable share from this. So basically what we have was two atomic operations for each future. One to update the counter, and one to decrement the reference counter on the shared thing itself. So nowadays we have an implementation like this. It's proven to be much, much better, much efficient, and it even gives times for the other futures to be ready. Remember that if we call attach callback on, on a ready future, it runs immediately. We don't need to put the callback anywhere. Uh, so this turns out to, to work much better, even though it looks weird that we're doing this sequentially. Now, I mentioned that a pattern, a use pattern that we have is have a vector with a number of futures that represent results of some task. I'm using three here, but imagine 300. And we notice, uh, we notice the following patterns. People wanted to wait until of those, all those futures were ready. So what we noticed were, for instance, this, when all these futures are ready, wait for them to be ready. And as I said, calling when all will invalidate all these futures in here. So yes, this will wait for all the futures to be ready, but then you don't have the futures anymore. Now, maybe it's a future void. Maybe you store the results somewhere in, in a different manner, and this is OK. Uh, but most likely, you want those futures back because you want to read whatever the result was. So the next uh, attempt is calling when all. And instead of calling dot wait, we call dot get, and we get that vector of futures back. So we put it again into our vectors of futures. Now, this works. Uh, it does allocate two vectors, because we have the vector of futures here. When we call one all, we have a new vector. This one is full of, of, invalid, vect uh, of invalid futures. And here, we just replace the old one with the new one. And we also lost the, the notion of future here. We have to. We don't have a future anymore, which we could use to compose if we wanted to. So seeing those use patterns in, in our code bases, uh, we decided to implement an extension. This is not part of the concurrency TS. Um, we see one all as uh, an n-dimensional dot then, and we added wait all as an n-dimensional dot wait. Uh, waiting on a future, wait is a const member function. It doesn't affect the future at all. It simply suspends execution until it's ready. And it comes in two flavors, the one that takes the pair of iterators and the one that takes the variadic pack of futures. Question. Sorry, um, were you saying the last one there, it looks to me like it has no get to the bottom one, and that means, is it, is it the way that it doesn't return a future well, dollar to actually do that in place? Wait all returns void. Uh, future dot wait returns void. The question is, the question is, the wait all doesn't have a dot get, so what happens to the futures? Uh, future dot wait uh, has a return type void, it doesn't return anything. It simply suspends until the future is ready. So it's just shorthand for writing out longer than that. For this is, it's not only shorthand, because you, you the futures, remember that when all will, will invalidate those futures, it will take, it will acquire those futures. So this implies that when all acquires those futures and then it gives back to us, wait all simply, it doesn't need to acquire anything, it doesn't need to modify the futures, it simply has to wait until all of them are ready. So you could think of it as a shortcut for, you know, for all the futures in this thing, future.wait, except that's more efficient because the The incrementation and the, the, the logic that handles when a future is ready is uh, handled in the thread that sets the future ready itself. So we don't need to have a thread that wakes up and goes to sleep and wakes up and goes to sleep. Okay, thanks. There. Um, so why is this an extension not part of the concurrency? Because we haven't proposed it yet. Do you want to? <laughs> 
I saw a hand. No? Okay. In Boostred? Yeah, it's possible that Boostred has this extension. I mean, it's the logical equivalence to dot then when all dot wait wait all. And we will, at some point, uh, propose it for standardization. <coughs> now, when any? When any is another piece of the concurrency TS. Uh, what it does is simple. It composes futures <coughs> so that the future that it returns is ready when any of the futures given as input uh, are ready. Now, you'll see that when any returns a future of a when any result of a vector of future synth. That's a mouthful. Uh, and the history goes somewhere like this. In an early version of the proposal, uh, when any was returning a tuple with an index, an index to the future that was made ready, and the vector of futures that were used an, as arguments. Now, the committee didn't like the way that the tuple was used there for good reason. And the, the solution to that was to have wait when any simply return a future of a vector of futures. Now, I mentioned that we have maybe 300 futures or 1,000 futures in there. So we call one any because we want to do something when one of them, whichever of them, is ready. With the new interface, how do we know which one is ready? Well, you just walk the vector, the 300 or 1,000 vector of future senior vector, and you ask to each of them, are you ready? No, are you ready? Until you find one that is ready. This was not an option for us. So we asked for, for, for some functionality that would let us know which future was the one that was detected as ready. And at the time a new overload was added, it was called when any swapped, I think, and it was later renamed to when any back. When any swap, when any back returned the future effector of futures as well, but whichever future was ready, it would swap it with the element in the back. So you know, you know that the one at the back is the one that's ready. But then the committee didn't like the name wait, wait any, when any swapped. It didn't like when any back either. So eventually what they asked for is to have a when, when any result, which I'm not showing. When any result is simply a structure that holds an index to the future that was ready and whatever sequence of futures we eat. Uh, just as when all, when any comes in the a flavor that takes pair of iterators and the sequence is a vector of futures. In fact, this is a vector of whatever future the iterator has points to. And the, the variadic version returns a when any result of a tuple of the inputs that we get to it. Now, I'm not going to show when any because we have an extension to when any that shares the same implementation, the implementation for the same, for both of them are the same. It's called when sum. And obviously it returns a when sum result. Now, when sum takes a number of futures that you want to wait for. So when any is simply when sum with wait just for one future. Um, And I'm going to show you how we implement when sum. We have, a, again, a dedicated share state. The share state has an atomic counter. And the goal, that's the number of futures that we're waiting for, as well as a when sum result of vector of future. And when we construct the share state, we move all those futures into the result. And then we have to set, we have to attach a callback to each and every one of those futures because you never know which ones are going to be ready and which ones are going to take forever. So this is the implementation you talked about for when all, right? Is this like the inefficient when all, right? So the question is whether this is the implementation that is the inefficient when all. Yes, our initial implementation only had one sum. And when, I when any called one sum with one and when all called one sum with all of them. So yes, that, that was the implementation that we were using. So as I was saying, 
we simply attach a callback to each and every future in there and we atomically increment the counter until we reach the goal uh, we have to, oh I forgot to mention that when any result has, holds an index uh, when some result cannot hold just one index it holds a vector of indices instead so we add the index of each future that we detect as ready to, come to, to achieve the goal and once we are done and we have all the all the features that we're waiting for we set ourselves as ready now when some comes also in a pair, a, an overload taking a pair of iterators and an overload taking a periodic number of futures and there's also weight equivalence there's also weight equivalence to, to when any I forgot to say that and that's it for my part any questions? questions. So yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering about cancelable futures. Like if, if I draw the last future referring to a task, is there any way to then get that future not to execute? Like if I, you know, I have a future and I then, 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 and then oh, I don't care anymore. Yes, that's an interesting question. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, to repeat the question. Uh, how, what about cancelable futures? So, um, uh, what about if I have a cascade of dot thens and um, eventually at some point in time I just want to cancel the task because I reached some kind of goal and yeah, what happens? So, um, yes, we do support um, to cancel tasks. Um, that's uh, totally feasible. But um, as Augustine said already we have those um, uh, user level lightweight tasks, right? So, and those tasks are uh, non preemptive, right? So, we, we, we can't really um, just cancel them at any point in time. You only um, can cancel them at some interruption points, similar to, to what boost threat, for example. That's that's actually completely orthogonal to um, to the whole shared state business. Uh, so the question was if if um, if it's easy to build it on top what 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 we showed today. So um, the answer is that's completely orthogonal. It's how the um, threat suspension and um, the whole threat mechanism is actually implemented. Right. So, right. so the question is if you have been a chain of dot bins and you let go of the last. <coughs> calculated up to some point, but some tasks haven't even started yet. Is there any way to not start the tasks that haven't started yet? Just release the resources, drop them all on the floor, and that last feature doesn't So the question was if, if there's a mechanism to just drop the last dot tens if they haven't been computed yet. Um, I don't think we have that implemented. Augustine shakes his head now. So, so you have to have some kind of handle to the to the underlying threat to be able to cancel them. So it's not not that easy. Not if they haven't started yet. You don't have to start. You just have to know at invocation time that you don't need to. Yes, yes, that's that's true. Yeah. But then the, the shared state basically has to somehow count how many people are still alive on it, and when that number drops to zero, then it needs to make something go away. Well. Well, you can implement that cancellation mechanism um, dynamically in your user code, right? You, I mean, uh, if, when you attach a continuation, you, you can always have some condition to, to further attach a continuation, right? It's, yeah, it's so it's... it's I, I would, well, during my time, very difficult to compose cancellation on its basis to futures. Yeah. And, 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 you know, because it's like, like you, you need to know the chain all the way through, so you need to have some additional state that gets passed around with the future everywhere and get
gets passed in to each task that gets queued on to the dump bin, right? And so, um, and it means you can't do like dot bin dot bin dot bin because you need the you need the new cancellation token from each one. To yeah. All the way so it makes it, it much more difficult. So, so the comment was that it's not. Um, not straightforward to implement cancellation in a dot then chain, which totally makes sense, yeah, of course. Can I just clarify a little bit now what's been presented looks fairly conventional um, insofar as the current CTS, it looks a pretty conventional implementation of what you would do, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. But um, so, so the comment was that uh, what Augustine presented is a very conventional technique, so um, you might have noticed that there hasn't been any notion of HPX or something like that, right? It's, it has just been well, well known uh, standard names and um, more or less a very straightforward implementation. Um, that's actually what I'm trying to tackle uh, in my part. So the nice thing uh, w w with that abstraction is that, you, that, you, um, that we were able to more or less easily build on top of those abstractions to to form the HPX future landscape, right? And um, our API, our, our framework doesn't only support uh, local tasks, local threats, but it also um, supports uh, distributed memory applications. So the origin of HPX is in the high performance community, uh, high performance computing community, and um, usually what you have there are, are big clusters with, with um, a, lot of, a lot of machines and, and uh, all of those machines have um, their own memory space, their own memory banks. And um, the, w one of the underlying ideas of HPX is to have a, a global address space. So um, that global address space spans over, um, over all participating processes or uh, we call them localities and the idea is that that you can access objects living in the global address space um, with the same mechanisms that the standard defines more or less so we try to to find a a natural extension to to local tasks and um, and what's, what's very interesting is that the, the very basic building blocks that Augustine already showed um, can be used to actually, to actually build up the, the remote task. So um, what we have on a, on a local node is, is just we have uh, CPUs or, or GPUs or any other accelerators and on each, uh, each CPU, so, so there can be one, one CPU or two CPUs or four or whatever number and each CPU has a certain number of cores and um, each, each core runs a, um, its own well threat queue, so its own threat scheduler where, where, the, where the tasks you, 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 um, you create with async or, or similar um, get queued up and eventually scheduled. So um, can anybody read this in the back? <laughs> okay, so um, an idea of how to 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 get objects in the um, in the global address space is that you can just call um, new underscore because well yeah new new is, is an operator an, an operator and we can't easily overload it so we just call uh, new and we pass the the locality where we want to create that object and. Um, any numbers of, of constructor arguments and uh, what we get is a future holding an ID type, right? And the ID type is something like a void pointer kind of thingy that points to an object in the global address space. Okay, and um, eventually we can, we can use that ID to call an action on that. And I'm going to, to explain the mechanism um, in a little bit more detail later on, but um, you can al already see that it's very similar to to um, what we saw before. I think I 
Yeah. Anyways, so and 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 you still get a a regular feature back that works with the same mechanisms that had had been presented. So and you eventually end up in in an HPX application with with a lot of objects living in the in the global global address space. So the the dark blue rectangles represent an object in the global address space, and the the gray one represent an object uh, represent a, a reference to to the, to any of those objects. And uh, once you have the reference to that object, that ID type, it doesn't really matter. Um, from a programming perspective on on where the um, where the objects live in that in that global address space so uh, we even we even um, support or we even have an api such that the components can be actually migrated or moved from one locality to another um, transparently so the the user doesn't has have to adapt the addresses or rank or or whatever right and that's what we call AGAS, which stands for uh, Active Global Address Space. And the um, communication is happening in what we call parcel port, which is sending around parcels. But more on that later. <coughs> I have to get my drink. So here's a small overview of how it um, <coughs> of which functionalities we have to to um, to invoke tasks right so um, what what anybody what, what, what everybody probably knows is regular C++ function call syntax right we have we want to call an, an function f with some parameters and what the what the C++ standard library provides then is um, the async function and um, you can just pass it a function pointer, function object, lambda, whatever and um, have it create a, a synchronous task. And um, you can also bind functions and yeah, the, the usual stuff that um, you might be doing um, already. Um, the extension that HPX adds to, to that mix is the notion of actions. So um, an action in HPX is the um, is turning a regular function pointer into um, a type that can be sent over the wire so that, that we are able to do remote procedure calls. Um, we hide that behind some boilerplate generation macro so um, you don't have to know the nasty details and that and the interesting thing now is that an action is just yet another callable so um, you can use it almost identically as you used um, the regular functions so the only difference is that you that you have to pass this um, ID on where you want to call that function on so the, the remote object or the locality, right? And but but you can still call any number of parameters, and <coughs> of course, so this is a direct execution. The um, it ret it doesn't return a future or anything. It just returns the the regular result, but it blocks the the current thread it's running on, and um, but you can still call it with async and get a future back. The extension that HPX adds is um, the apply function. Apply is well is an optimization um, which returns void, and <coughs> the optimization is that we don't have to create a shared state um, um, because we are not interested in the in the result of the function call. We just we just want to say. Um, just just execute that function. We we don't care when and and how. Just just execute it, and we are not interested in the result. And it's an it's an optimization because you can um, just as well let the um, future that gets returned by async go out of scope. But um, 
once you create a future, you have this shared state which, uh, to which the result has to be sent back. So you might not want to have that in, for example, a distributed case. So it, it just gets rid of the whole synchronization mechanism. Okay, so um, local tasks. So there's a typo. Um, as Augustine already mentioned, we implement very lightweight user level tasks. So that means that it, the, the context switching doesn't depend on the operating system to, to, to switch the, the context like stack pointer and um, um, program counter and stuff like that. It, it's, it, it works similar to, to what boost context provides, right? You, you have um, you have your, your frame <coughs> and you can switch the different frames. And um, it has the advantage that each, each task holds its own stack. So um, that means that, that also means that each user level task can suspend whenever it wants. So um, there, there has been a lot of discussions of whether the um, of, of, of having um, threat uh, stackless task or um, stack f tasks with thread stack stacks stacks. stack and stackless thanks um, we decided or, or what we all always had from the beginning of was um, task with stacks because um, being able to to suspend gives a very great flexibility on what you are able to express in in in, in your tasks and you don't have any arbitrary well, kind of arbitrary. Uh, how large are your stacks? That depends. It's configurable. Um, but by default, it's, I think, 8 kilobyte? No. Yeah, it's a very small stack. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what we want to have is, oh, the question was, how large are the stacks? Sorry, um, it's a very small stack, yeah, because what, what we want to have are really fine grand tasks, right? And if you have just a few couple of, of instructions ideally executing, you don't need that large of a stack. So, um, but it's configurable if you need a, a larger stack. I think pthread is at about eight megabyte something. Um, so y you can still have that, but you really don't need that. And right. So the task scheduling is something like a um, thread pool implementation, but um, unlike the thread pool executors discussed in the in the standards committee um, recently. We provide the uh, weekly parallel forward progress guarantee. That means that even though some of the, st the stacks suspend, um, we still guarantee that if there's work available, the work will get executed. And that's, exact that's exactly the, the, um, the advantage of having those, those lightweight, lightweight tasks, right? Even though a task suspends, there's still can be another task that can be executed on that operating system thread. So um, we don't have that limitation in, in our implementation. Um, the other thing that, that we implemented is with, with some scheduling strategies is work stealing. Yes, Niall. Can the tasks move between operating system threads? Yes, they do. That's the um, possible work stealing. So actually, if one, one operating system thread runs out of work, it looks in the, in the neighboring um, course for, for, for more work. Yes, please. The question was, uh, or the statement was that on Boost Fiber, it is tricky and, well, and no. yeah and, and and how do we do with that yeah. well um, actually we don't have a specific mechanism for that I mean we, we, we just um, so when I 
when a task hasn't been started, it's very easy, right? You just um, get the task description. But um, the, the difficulty is when, um, when, when some task has been suspended and then gets stolen by another thread, right? So um, we save enough state such that, that's, such that this isn't a problem at all. So, so the question was um, how the um, stack relocation um, can be done. Um, the stack point is actually part of the threat state. So um, when we allocate a, a stack, we, we do, um, well, we essentially just call mmap to, to, to resurface the pages, right? And we just get a pointer back. And that pointer is valid on all threads, on all oper operating system cores. There's no reason why why the, the stack should be thread local, right? Uh, stack expansion is the So if you want to expand your stack arbitrarily into the future, I suppose you are the basic data page, that's Yes. The, the, so um, stack expansion um, is the problem. Yes, but once we suspend a thread, we um, fill all the pages that we allocated. So we save the complete stack and not, not only the stack that we have allocated, so, uh, that, that we have used so far. And that's why um, thread suspension is actually um, so expensive in HPX, right? Because once you need to suspend a thread, you have to, to, to copy all the, the, the stack memory um, into the, into the um, thread state. Um, yeah, and, and that's also the, the reason why we try to make the, the stack as small as possible. Any other question? Okay, and okay. So the task scheduling mechanism is actually um, can can be user defined, and um, the the cool thing is that um, the the scheduling algorithm. So if 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 you look at um, the the currently proposed stuff in the in the concurrency TS, one one of the most exciting things from from my point of view are executors. Because executors essentially will allow you to, to define your own threat scheduling mechanism, right? So it, it highly depends on the application if you want to have um, last in, first out scheduling mechanism uh, strategy or first in, first out, or do you want to have work stealing? Um, do you want to have it lock free? Do you want to have um, one, one task queue per, per, per core or is one shared task queue enough, for example? So it all depends on the uh, on, on the application, on the algorithm, on, on the use cases of the user. So executors are really an, an, a very exciting mechanism um, to, to, to let the, the user library writers define the, the, the way the, the parallel work gets executed. And it's a very nice way to, to actually optimize the, um, the execution of the, of the parallel tasks. And I'm looking very forward to to see that going on. Um, and yeah, so next slide is it might be a little bit confusing. It's um, log log scale on on both axes, so you can't read that. So um, o o one of the things that that um, we are always interested in is um, how fine grained can the tasks actually be? Where where are the bottlenecks? Of, of creating a, a task, right? And so w w one of the discussions that, that, that are happening is, do we really need a, uh, a future that allocates memory? Do, you, do we really need a shared state, right? And um, so I would say it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't really hurt. The, the memory allocation, at least in our case, is currently not the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the, the whole um, threat scheduling that's happening, the whole um, locking in the in the task queues and all that stuff, the creating of the of the stack, 
it's not <coughs> it's not the allocation of the shared state, right? Um, and um, the the message that I want to 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 get out here is, irregardless of how the um, the shared state is allocated, it's always a matter of grain size, right? So um, maybe that there are use cases where you really want to compose um, like a single operation um, with your with your dot then chain, right? That it's a valid use case, but um, that's not really how 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 um, we are able to 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 support. Um, so that. That's not something that, that we in HPX are able to support because if you if you do a uh, context switch, you need at least um, a context switch alone is in is in the is in the order of a, a few hundred nanosec uh, um, a few hundred cycles currently, right? So that alone kind of makes the 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 the, the memory allocation costs go away, especially if you use special allocators. So the um, you, you don't even have to change your, your, your code. You can just link to a different allocator, which is more efficient than the standard system allocator. Yes, please. I'm wondering why this, uh, when you say this, um, I take it that HPX does use a special allocator, and these statements you just made about overheads are based on special allocator rather than standard ones? So the question is if, um, about the allocator that HPX uses, and if we um, use a special allocator. Yes and no. So um, HPX itself doesn't, um, well, it does have special allocators um, inside, but the, but the real speed up comes from not relying on the system, systems provided malloc implementation, but use something like um, JE malloc or TC malloc or whatever, right? And, and that brings the real, st uh, a significant speed up over the, um, the, the standard systems allocator. And uh, so th w what this graph shows is um, execution of, um, I think, 10 million tasks on uh, a machine with uh, 16 cores. Um, each core has two hyper threads, so can more or less execute two operating system threads at a time. And um, what we're interested in is um, how does the grain size of the executed tasks affect the speed up. So it's, um, and so the, so it goes from, from one nanosecond to a thousand microseconds of grain size, right? And what you can see is that, that approximately a hundred microseconds kind of grain size, a uh, hundred microseconds grain size, you, you almost reach the, the maximum of the, of the achievable speed up, so and th and, th and that's the mes message. If you if you want to use um, multiprocessor um, futures, if you want to compose, if you if you want to use um, parallelism using futures, then um, you have to to design your algorithms such that you're able to to control the grain size um, so that the um, maximum speed up can be achieved. Okay. Yeah. And the, the grain size is just how long your task takes. To yes, yes. So the grain size is just how long the task takes. Okay. So let's move on to remote tasks. So in in the local regular case, it's it's very easy, right? You have your your object f, um, f of type foo, and you call um, the member function. Um, bar on it, so you you get the member function pointer. You pass a pointer to the um, to the object and 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 an argument, right? And then eventually that 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 member function will be executed on a separate thread. Okay, so far so good. So um, what HPX? So so here here's the natural extension, right? So um, the only thing that we need to do is we need to define a component action so components are the uh, our our notation of of objects living in the global address space so you need to to adapt the the foo bar function to to an action create a foo object in the uh, global address space and then it's very similar right 
you have the bar action contrast that to the to the member function pointer then you have the ID of that object very similar to the to the pointer to the object and the uh, argument to the function okay So what happens behind the scenes then is that um, all the arguments to async get packaged up into a parcel. Um, and a parcel is then a piece of contiguous memory holding all the information that the um, remote sites site needs to, to schedule the, um, the resulting threat. So we have a identifier to the action we have the ID where we want to call that action on, and we have the um, the argument, and we need to have a continuation. So, yes, please. But actually, not f dot get is sent, but the ID that was returned for the future. Yes, the result of so not f not f dot get is sent, but the result of the f dot get expression. So the ID type. Um, I just I didn't want to write ID here because then it got then it would have gotten yeah uh, uh, uh. and the the continuation here is not a um, not a function as in the in the local case but it's it's um, another object that got registered in the in the global uh, in the global address space right so it has an ID and it has actions so once once the the function has been executed we apply um, we apply the continuation and send the result back to the to the caller and the shared state of the future returned here will get set okay so um, after the, the 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 parcel has been packaged up it can be sent over the wire via any parcel transport mechanism can be any network transport layer you can imagine. So, yeah, anything. It's it's completely abstracted away, and that's that's one nice thing you get from the uh, from the global address space abstraction because you don't really care about the IP address or um, if you if you com communicate via via shared 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 interprocess <coughs> memory or uh, InfiniBand or um, serial port or whatever you can imagine. So um, it's completely abstracted behind the, the parcel transport. And eventually that, that needs to get unpackaged again. And um, once we have it unpackaged, we can resolve the ID to, to, an, to the local address and um, call the member function. And once that's ready, we can send the result back. Okay. Yes? And the global address space has to be within the same architecture, correct? No. no. So the, glo the global address space, the question was if the global address space needs to be in the same architecture. No. So um, we support heterogeneous environments. So. Uh, one of our collaborators is working on um, um, blue chain systems. Um, yeah, so um, having the back end in a blue chain and the front end on an x86, for example, for remote visualization or anything. So that's perfectly possible. We also have a demo where we have the visualization front end on an Android tablet running an ARM processor and the simulation running on um, both a CPU and a Xeon Phi um, coprocessor. So that's um, the architecture doesn't need to match, the bitness doesn't need to match, and the endianness doesn't need to match. Right? But um, if you want to have the maximal speed, then the endianness should better match, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, w what's happening here is, is, very, is, is more or less a 
serialization or marshalling process, right? And um, currently that takes most of our time. Um, it, it adds significant overhead here. Okay. Um, but it kind of works. Um, so um, this shows um, results from a run with uh, 20 in, in the order of 24,000 nodes. It runs a, a very simple um, short range n body simulation. Um, so, so nothing fancy like um, like like Barnes Hut, but but really um, uh, only only short range interactions, and um, it runs on um, the NERSC Edison machine, which is a um, Cray XC30 machine. So, unless you guys we actually can make use of C++ 11 compilers there, which is a fortune, which is really really fortunate. So. Um, we are um, very, very nicely able to, to scale here in the distributed case. And um, from the same run, I, I plotted the, the number of, of, of tasks run, run per, per locality, so per process. And what you can see, it peaks at uh, 2,600 tasks, tasks per locality. Um, and that's pretty nice, I think. Um, yeah. yeah the, so there was scaling. That the problem scales with the amount of processes. Yeah. So it's weak scaling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, the next big thing we are working on, which is currently work in process, so we are still refining and, and looking for, for nice abstractions is GPU tasks. So um, we are not executing HPX on the GPUs directly. Right? So please don't get confused with that. We, we just use um, GPUs as a offloading device. Okay? But um, what we try to achieve is to, to embed the usage of, of GPUs or, or any accelerator into our framework, so uh, we we don't need to to go away from our abstractions that we already have. That means that all GPU devices that are installed in the system are globally addressable. So each device has its own ID type. Memory allocated on the GPUs has their own ID type as well. So we can we can remotely address the the memory buffers and we can send stuff remotely and the events so um, our um, GPU um, extension is based on OpenCL so we are not limited to only GPUs but also any accelerator that supports OpenCL and you have this nice thingy called OpenCL events and OpenCL events are um, similar to promise and similar to future so they are not really a shared state, but kind of are. But it's, it's, very, it's a very strange structure. Um, but we hide that from the user. So whenever you call a OpenCL function that might return an event, um, we, we hide that behind a future. So that means you can, you can use um, the future mechanism that Augustine showed um, to compose tasks to run on the GPU which is a very nice feature. Not only your local GPU, but any GPU in the system. And I think that's pretty nice. And um, here's how it works. So um, the slide's called from async to GPUs. Well, calling a single task on a, on a GPU doesn't really make a lot of sense. You really want to, to spawn uh, a whole lot of tasks. So. Um, the, the current API that we have is very closely modeled to, to what OpenCL so what OpenCL already provides, but kind of in, in, in a nice C++ um, user interface. So you can, you can look for all devices, you can create a buffer on a device, and you can enqueue um, a write command onto that buffer. 
um, you get a future back and when you um, want to enqueue a kernel you can pass the future and the um, execution of that kernel is only started when that future is ready okay and um, yeah what, what we have now is, is very much a proof of concept and I think the future directions should be that the um, OpenCL devices and buffer creation and whatnot should be embedded behind execution policies uh, and or executors okay and the OpenCL stuff the whole accelerator stuff should be hidden behind parallel algorithms if you're interested in how parallel algorithms are implemented with HPX you can visit Grant Mercer's talk on Friday um, but unfortunately not with OpenCL yet with, with the HPX CL abstraction and um, another nice feature would be to to hide all the buffer management behind a um, distributed data structure that you can just use with uh, just use transparently with the with the parallel algorithms so to show you that um, the abstraction that we built so the um, adding adding the the layer of the global address space um, isn't isn't going to hurt us um, my student Martin Stumpf uh, wrote a small example namely a um, Mandelbrot set renderer so what he did was he he created a web server where a Google Maps API client queries um, sends some queries and this web server um, pushes commands into a queue um, then the, the the GPU tasks to to render certain certain tiles in in that map are created and um, sent out to the GPU workers right and um, so it's it's using a master slave approach and what's interesting though is that um, even though it's a master master slave approach this this um, this mechanism still works quite well up until um, using 32 um, GPUs and the 32 GPUs are not located on, on one system but located on 32 different nodes and the parallel efficiency is always around um, 90 percent so that's pretty nice okay that's about it um, if you want to have more information um, please visit our blog we have we regu we well, we intend to regularly uh, do blog posts there. Um, our code is open source. You can access it on GitHub. Um, the core library, the HPX framework, and the HPXCL framework. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us um, either via the mailing list or the IRC channel. Um, we usually have someone available to talk at any time due to the distributed nature of our development. That's really nice. <laughs> so, and uh, as already mentioned, um, um, <coughs> Grant's talk on parallelizing the STL on Friday um, will give some insight on um, how we build higher level abstractions on top of HPX, or well, Grant did the work there. But yeah, any questions? Okay. Last fall, I think there was a representation of HPX, and there was a very interesting comparison how uh, future-like based parallel computations are eating fork joint computations for the same set of problems. Is that still true? So the question was that um, on last CP on on the, on the last CPP con there was a nice presentation on HPX where it has been shown that um, the HPX approach beats the um, currently available fork join approaches and if that would be still true yes that's still true we we even um, we are constantly improving our stuff so um, a lot of stuff 
inside of the HPX code base is still, well, proof of concept. And we know a lot of places where we can actually improve, right? So, and we constantly try to, to improve the performance of our code base. in some real world applications or commercial applications or research applications or that are people that are not interested in the programming per se but really just want to use it to get some some particular kind of work done what kind of work that might be so the question was if we have um, users <laughs> 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 well as funny as it might seem yeah um, so we are a group of researchers funded mostly by, by um, public sector um, f uh, grants, right? And um, we are currently building up a larger and larger user base. So um, what we, the, the developments that, that um, have happened in the, in the last couple of months is that we, that we acquired um, significant research funds. So um, either on the, on the US side, so we have a very large um, NSF funding going on, um, which um, is really focusing on getting um, a um, um, hurricane simulation um, tool being ported to HPX. So um, this will be our biggest user in the future um, because it's um, the, the, the hurricane modeling and simulation is what um, what, what do you guys see when, when there's a hurricane coming up? So um, once the EMC WF provides you with the global data, then um, the, the Sarah guys in Louisiana run the, the localized um, simulations. And it turns out that, uh, that they don't scale very well and there has been a proposal to port the, their application to HPX. That's one point. The other point is that we are majorly funded with the uh, or will be funded with the um, European uh, within the European H2020 um, grants, um, where we hope to get a lot of new users as well. And um, there are a lot of different other groups in in the um, in Europe and in the US that use HPX already. Um, the use cases range from, well, just being tired of, of using OpenMP and MPI, um, just want to try out something new to, to really hit a, a bottleneck with the, with the currently available programming models. So the usual fork join or um, um, lock stepping method that, that you have in MPI programming. Yes, please. Right. So I, I'm on understanding that you're getting extremely good throughput of the system with these approaches, right? But what are the, the latencies on really, really small tasks? Like, like, let's say I just wanted to calculate a web page. Um, the, a lot of time. <laughs> the question is that, um, so um, we seem to get really good throughput, but what are the latencies of, of um, running a task? That depends. Um, of course, but so um, usually the, the the latencies are in the microseconds range. So in the and um, I say I would say um, ten to twenty microseconds usually currently. So yeah. So does that include cross machine? Calls? That that includes cross machine calls. Yes. Yeah. It depends on the scheduler, it depends on... Hmm? They can enter whether you're using infinite band or whatever. Y yes, it depends on the, on, the, on the connection, on the, on the underlying network, it depends on the, on the scheduler, it depends on the load in, on, in the system. And so it's really hard to, to predict that. Um, he was first, I think. Um, is it possible to set task priorities? Um, yes, it is. 
Is your is it important that for your throughput that the task be compute, compute bound versus IO bound? Um, is it important uh, for the throughput to be to to have um, compute bound tasks versus uh, memory bound tasks? No, it's not. So um, actually, that's um, an interesting question because if if you are memory bound, it doesn't make sense to use the the whole system, right? Mm. Because if if you if you're memory bound and just are able to to um, or, or if, if, you're, if your memory bandwidth saturates after a certain amount of cores being used, right, it doesn't make sense to use all of the system. So that's actually where executors will help a lot because you can constrain your specific memory bound allocator to use only a certain part of your, of your system to save energy. But if you are compute bound, of course, then um, it scales infinitely inf until you hit the memory bandwidth. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Need to think a little. Um, so it, do you give any special support for uh, heterogeneous fleets in the sense that the versions of the software you're running are different a part of the fleet. Let's say you're in the middle of the upgrade cycle. So the question is if we support different versions in a single application. Currently not, no. And There's no way to request a version and introspect that and manually deal with it. So is there a way to introspect the version? So we've been depending on the marshalling um, to use boost serialization. Boost serialization um, supports versioning, um, but only just recently we decided to go away from boost serialization because, so we, we kept the interface of boost serialization, so any user of boost serialization can still use our interface. But the reason we went away from boost serialization isn't because it's a bad library, but it <coughs> happened that for our use case we already have rewritten almost all of boost serialization. Um, it's, it, it kind of just happened because, so at, at one point in time we, we discovered that we, uh, okay, to answer your question, and we decided to, to um, throw away the versioning. But if you have a use case then, but um, it hasn't been used very, very often. Or not even, uh, and 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 there's no clean clean. So it was not clear to us even even though if a application um, runs an older or a new version, how would you how would you convert between them? Right. So it, it would add an additional overhead for us for a use case which might not be there. It would cost everybody. It but only a couple people would use it. Yes, yes, right. It would cost everybody, though even, even a couple of people would use it. So that's why we went away from versioning. In your diagram, you show the GPU scales very nicely to 32. What happened after 32? So the question was um, in, the, in the GPU graph. Um, it scaled very very nicely until 32. And what happened after 32? We don't know. We only have 32 um, GPUs on that system. Yeah, but if you if you're interested in, in running it with more GPUs, then give us give us access to a machine with more. <laughs>